Welcome neophytes and Cenobites to Tibble's Apprentice episode 33. Today we have a special episode in store, one like we've never seen before. Um, primarily because I haven't filmed this yet, or haven't filmed like this yet. Uh, haven't, yeah. Anyhow, what's going on here is we're going to consult Tibble's journal for winning MTG decks. And what we'll find there is budget MTG decks. We get a chance to talk with David from budget MTG decks and get a little bit of insight as to how decks are created, how winning decks are created. Uh, we're looking at about a month to three month process. Well, I don't have that kind of time. So luckily David and his crew is out there doing it for us. So without any further ado, Let's consult that Tibbles journal. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So let's lead in then to some of the questions that I had for you, which yeah. is, uh, how do you find a commander card? How do you choose that commander? Uh, how do I choose a commander? Well, there's actually um, about four ways in which we can uh, we can choose a commander. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, exposure. So that basically means, have you been exposed to a certain commander? I don't mean exposed inappropriately. I mean as in that you <laughs> Uh -huh. or opened it in a, in a pack or has somebody showed you a certain card or maybe during spoiler season, season you saw this card. So basically you've been exposed to a certain card. You see it. You think, hey, this is pretty cool. You think, I want to build something around that. That's one way that you can do it. Another way is looking at the uh, commander ability. So you're, certain, you're looking for something very specific. You're looking for something that has a certain effect. And then you, you, you look in your search, in your scryfall, for example, you're going to look for... Uh, legendary creatures that have a certain type of ability uh, because you want to build a deck around that ability. Mm -hmm. And we also have uh, color identity. It could be that you don't have any particular strategy or synergy or theme that you want to go for, but you do know that you like certain cards and those are in these three colors, for example. So then you're going to go for, uh, doesn't matter what the commander does, doesn't matter what creature type it is. The, it All that matters is, it, it has uh, these colors, this color identity, so that I can build the deck around uh, the, um, uh, around these colors, let's say. Right. And the last one, and that's the one I think is most fun, and that is you just go uh, according to theme. Right. So it could be that you want to go tribal uh, or, or uh, maybe a, a type of strategy could, would also go in the, under that theme. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the commander... Uh, has that particular ability, like in the, the second example, but it could be also just very flavorful. Right. So those are essentially the, the four ways in which in which uh, we like to pick a commander. And by far, I think the way that we pick our commander the most is, uh, I think, thematic and commander ability. Okay. Because it's really very small situations in which we uh, are forced to go with uh, color identity. Mm-hmm. There is one example which we did have. I wanted to build a uh, graveyard uh, theme deck, and I wanted, uh, I wanted for sure, I wanted white and black for it. But also there was some. Uh, I wanted a lot of mill, which means I needed blue for that. Right. So I needed blue, black, and white because those were the colors that I thought would work really well with the cards that I needed for this graveyard theme deck. But there was no. Uh, uh, commander with those three colors, which had a theme, uh, a theme that had something to do with the graveyard. Right. So, uh, so that's why I, I picked uh, Eretide the Corrupted, mm -hmm. which just says uh, sacrifice a creature or enchantment, and then uh, you can counter target spell. It works. It's fine. It's yeah. got nothing to do really with what the rest of the deck wanted to do. Okay. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. So then, I guess that kind of leads into my second one: was uh, do you have a pool of keywords or effects that you look for, or do you again? I kind of, guess you kind of answered that. You kind of look for all of those elements when you get your commander, and then build out from there. Yeah, there's uh, when it comes to building the rest of the deck. Let's say when I'm just looking at the commander, then I look at the things that I just discussed. Uh, but if I look at the the rest of the deck, there's a couple of things that I want every deck to do. Mm -hmm. 
Then we have, and that's, that comes forward, I think, as well a little bit in the uh, in each one of the deck techs on, on the channel, is that we have a group of what I call the synergy. Mm-hmm. These are cards that uh, work well together with the theme, the idea, the tribe of what the deck wants to do. Okay. And that's going to be the biggest uh, grouping of cards. Um, so if it's, for example, uh, this graveyard theme deck that we're talking about, then in the synergy, there would be the categories, okay, what does this deck want to do? Okay, I want to... I want to uh, mill cards. I want to uh, reanimate stuff. I want stuff that cares about the graveyard. Okay, uh, these are the kind of cards that have synergy with the strategy of the deck, so those go into the synergy. But then I also have, uh, for example, protection, and these are the kind of cards that uh, make sure that either we stay alive or make sure that our stuff doesn't die or make sure that we don't get attacked too much or maybe we want to counter some stuff. Basically, the stuff that are protect gives hexproof or uh, or shroud to our commander, for example, stuff that keeps us or our stuff safe. Uh, we look also for some control, and that's the category which basically makes sure that uh, the synergies are the cards that make sure that we can do what we want to do, and the control are the cards that make sure that other people can't do the stuff that they want to do. So that's creature removal, uh, enchantment artifacts, so non-creature removal, maybe some graveyard removal, uh, counter spells could also go in this category, uh, some board wipes, so everything to make sure that we can kind of keep control of the board. And lastly, uh, actually not lastly, but second to last, we've got a card advantage, so stuff that we can, you know, fill our hands, play stuff from the graveyard, um, return some stuff back from the graveyard to our hands, for example. This is for just any regular uh, deck. And lastly, we would have uh, some ramp cards. And the the ratio in which these I select these abilities or the cards that fit in these categories that that wildly differs depending on the deck, but usually you want to in Commander kind of have like a little bit of everything to right. make it kind of balanced out. What you'll notice with decks uh, such as uh, uh, Ward the Raid Mother that we have uh, on the channel, which is very combo oriented, that one has a lot of synergy cards. You just focus on okay, we're gonna we're gonna and a lot of ramp because mm-hmm. it likes it, it needs to get a lot of mana, so it's gonna ramp like crazy. It's going to try and get the combo off and deal tons and tons of damage with the, uh, making sure there's got also t- tons of tokens. Uh, but it, it's very light on the card advantage and it's very light on the control. It's very light on the protection because it just wants to try and combo out and then just kill everybody. So, um, but other decks will try and find a little bit more, uh, especially the more creature based decks will have fun. We'll usually have a little bit more of a balance between those. I have no idea if that answers your question. Yes, that is, it definitely does. So it uh, really comes down to the, the cards that you want to pull. So you have specific, I won't say you have a shell that you do, but like you said, there are specific things you want every to do. And therefore you build and then find the cards that slot into those positions. And one thing that I also find uh, important to try and keep in the, uh, or we try and keep in the back of our, our minds when we're building this is that um, there's a lot of, uh, let's say in, in Commander, when you're not looking at a budget, you have format staples. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got cards, your soul rings, for example. Right. Um, these are cards that are quite expensive or maybe even slightly affordable, but everybody thinks, oh, they're auto-includes in every deck, or if you're playing this color, you got to play this because it's the best a creature, best removal. And also, when it comes to budget, you also have those cards, which are very good. And we try to make sure that not every deck that has the same color has a repetition of those same cards. So what it might be that uh, we have, for example... Um, uh, for black, a great card draw uh, spell is uh, the creature Grim Horror Specs, for example. Right. And whenever a creature of yours dies, you get to uh, lose a life, draw a card. It's just a very strong card. It's very nice. It just became budget again, so I like to put it in in, in my in the next deck that I'm uh, that I'm building. Right. right now, in this example would be uh, uh, Gerard Golgari Lich Lord, which is going to be coming out soon. Sweet. Because he also likes uh, Gerard likes it when its creatures die and go to the graveyard, so it's a perfect card. But it is just a solid, basically good card draw card. But what I want to make sure is that the next videos that come out that have black that they don't also have it. Because what happens is if you use always, let's say, the best of a certain type, your car, your decks become very, uh, very yeah, linear, very, 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 yeah. And, and the, I think the fun, the great fun of Commander is the surprise of when you draw cards, when you or look at your opening hand, when you're playing with a new deck that you see completely new cards every single time. And I think the joy of having multiple decks, number one, that's the reason why it's fun to have budget decks because they can have lots of them. Right. That every time you get a different experience, and if every time you'd be 
you know, cookie cutter, say, okay, it's blue, so we're going to be having the same uh, uh, mass uh, uh, bounce spells and the same counter spells and the same uh, card draw spells, then uh, even though you might have three or four uh, decks with blue in it, they all share uh, 20% of the cards. Uh, I think that makes it less less interesting. Right, say. right, absolutely. Well, I know I've found that too because I've recently expanded my play group for a number of years now. There were just the four of us playing, um, and we played at the local card shops, McDonald's, wherever we could. But uh, this past month past two months in particular, I've specifically gone out and sought new play groups, just dropping into local comic book shops and getting a chance to see a variety. Because even in our group, we play the same or similar decks, and they tend to be not stale or repetitive, but, you know, kind of stale and repetitive from that standpoint. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to see other people's take on even some of the same cards and how they use them. Yeah. Really quick here. Now, you often say uh, that both yourself and we. Who else yeah. is uh, Budget MTG? Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, the channel originally started with my good friend, uh, Ruth. Mm-hmm. As you love know, one of the very, uh, the actually, first couple of years, the videos are always with, uh, with Ruth. Mm-hmm. He... Great builder, great player. He was also the one that uh, inspired me to to start the channel and gave me the uh, let's say emotional support to uh, to get this uh, whole mm-hmm. process started because um, he actually played Magic a number of years already before I started playing. He introduced me to it, and uh, he he played with more expensive cards. And I thought to myself, as a as a good Dutch person, I thought to myself, that's way too expensive. <laughs> So I thought there's got to be a way to do this uh, in a more inexpensive uh, fashion. So that's why we, uh, I, I thought, what if we only limit everything to just a dollar or less, and then we can actually all play on this on a level playing field, at least where our, our wallets will allow in either case. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, these are great ideas. I'll uh, I'll join you for making videos. So then we started building these decks together. Uh, as time progressed, um, uh, Ruud became uh, very focused on a lot of other stuff. He had a lot of stuff, other stuff going in uh, uh, in his life, mm-hmm. and uh, he still helped out a lot. So I'm super thankful for that, and uh, I couldn't have started this uh, this without him. But slowly but surely, other stuff became a priority, and other people started to, uh, you know, from the game shops wanted to help out. So kind of some of the load was taken off with people like Stefan and uh, Jasper coming in and uh, helping out a lot. Robert helped out a lot. Yoram, these are all people that uh, that came in with their ideas and came in and wanted to uh, help play test as well. We've also got a couple of people like uh, Barat who just come in and just whenever we we need to uh, try a new deck out, then they just come in and I say, okay, you got to play this, you got to play this, you got to play this. All right, let's go. And it's a good mix of uh, these people that play also non-budget decks. It's a good mix at the table of uh, people who know how to play expensive decks and people who know how to play budget decks, and we play them all together to make sure that the budget decks are kind of still on par, that we don't get uh, that that we all don't only play tests against uh, budget uh, decks. So these are the people that uh, that really help out a lot, and I wouldn't be able to uh, to make these uh, these videos without them. And also, they come up with a lot of inspiration and ideas. So that is essentially the the group of uh, of, of budget MTG decks. Uh, one person that doesn't like to be mentioned, but probably should be mentioned as part of the team, is uh, my girlfriend Lisa. Mm-hmm. Just like being on camera, even though she is. If you search through the videos, there are a couple of videos where she is in there, uh, and she just helps out. Uh, she supports me so much. I'll make sure that she picks up all the slack uh, at home. Uh, coincidentally, I'll be cooking today, but that is. <laughs> Definitely an exception uh, to the rule. Jesus makes a lot of that stuff. I gotcha. Well, that's great. And uh, so I want to thank, and I think everybody watching would want to thank every one of those people for the contribution that they make. Um, yeah. So once you've done that, you go through a series of play testing. So once the deck is designed, so how do you tune it? Do the decks usually fall into place once you already have them, or do they need to run through? I see you shaking your head. Tell me about yeah. that. No, no, no. So this is actually. Uh, usually a lot of people think, and that's also what happens when people uh, offer the idea to uh, they submit a deck, for example, either fans or, or people who know the show, they think, oh, I'll just submit a, a, a deck. This is actually a really great idea. And we have that as well. We see a commander, and the easiest part of deck building is the first draft. You might think, oh, it's hard to build a commander, how many lands, how, you know, how much removal, but we've gotten that basic first part down pretty easily that it takes us 
usually only a couple of hours to build the first draft of a deck, making sure that we got a fairly good balance of the different elements and, and what the deck wants to look like and most of the cards that you want to have in there. So about usually about 80% of the deck, over 100% of the deck is done in the first, uh, in, in the first round, let's say, but it's only going to have uh, only about 80 of those, uh, 80 percent of those cards are going to survive uh, that because from that point on, that's when the hard part starts. You start to play test, and then you play test, and you switch out some cards, and you play test again, and then you realize, okay, this element's completely, this this combination of cards completely doesn't work, or uh, I mean, we're going to need to have uh, more of a certain element that we didn't expect, and you really only figure that out with play testing. A lot of other people think. Uh, yeah, I've got very good grasp on the theory of building commander decks, so I can just build it. I look at it, I go, okay, it's got the right balance, we're done. But really only through rigorous playtesting against other budget decks, against uh, uh, expensive decks, also 1v1, we also playtest decks, 1v1 to make sure that if somebody were to target you with all their stuff, that you survive, you don't just only rely on the fact that you're playing with, let's say, three other people that you have enough time because it's multiplayer, so... All, during all these playtesting sessions and constantly switching out cards, that's the only time when you really start to uh, tweak the deck into what it will become its final form. And sometimes that could take up to three months. Okay, that was going to be my next question. How many times, and is there a set limit of how many rounds it has to go through, or does each deck uh, no. get something different? No, yeah, that's it, it's very different every single time. Uh, when it comes to a very uh, linear deck, let's say like Golgari, uh, uh, Gerard Golgari Lichlord, for example, that's a very simple, simple concept deck. It only wants to do a couple of things. That's uh, fill the graveyard, either recur the cards back to your hand or reanimate them immediately to the battlefield. It's very simple, and you got some removal there, but it's also already... Uh, very clear that you want to be using all, only almost creatures, so that limits the pool already. So the number of times you're going to have to play test a deck like that is going to be far less times. It's still going to take about a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the, and this is a this one has very little changes, even though maybe from the beginning already only ten cards change, but that's where all the time goes. But you also have some uh, decks, like for example, uh, you may have a, a deck which you think. Hey, this one's going to be... Let me see if I can get an example of here so I can make it a little bit more concrete. I'm going to look over here at what we have. Uh, Kikar Wins Fury, for example. And then you think to yourself, okay, that's going to be pretty easy as well. It's going to be... A, this card wants to be creating uh, uh, spirits, and oh yeah, we can sacrifice. It's the sacrifice outlet. All right, pretty simple. You're going to start building. And this is one that... Uh, takes much, much longer because you notice that after the first version that the uh, that just it doesn't seem to flow in the way that you want want it to flow. And you usually don't know this uh, right from the beginning, but you can get an, uh, kind of an inkling that if it's a straightforward deck, it's going to take less playtesting than maybe one that relies on more interactions to, to, to fire off. But usually between a month and three months is, is about how much time it's going to take before, uh, before we can finally put a stamp of approval. And we actually also have a couple of times where we've gone through this process, and in the end we had to scrap the whole thing because we didn't feel like it was, uh, it was up to par. Wow. Okay. That's got to be disheartening when that happens, but I imagine it, it doesn't it, happen too often. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen uh, too often, so I'm very relieved about that. But yeah, sometimes it does happen that somebody's really put a lot of effort into it and has play tested, uh, you know, so, so many times with the deck. Every time feeling they get closer, but uh, what we just notice if you keep on getting crushed every single time and stuff just doesn't seem to connect, uh, you'll figure out why that is. And, and sometimes. Just on a budget, you won't be able to do that. But luckily, we almost, almost in let's say ninety ninety five percent of the cases, uh, we'll always be able to find a budget solution that, that that works for a deck. Awesome. Well, I've got one final question here. Then, uh, and I'll let you get to making that dinner. Um, and that is, what do you do with the decks afterwards? Do you ever upgrade them? Do you ever plan to revisit any of them now that new sets are out? Uh, well, what we do is we have all the decks in, uh, in paper. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if, uh, let me just see if I can just show you where they are. Let me see. So here we have the magic station, let's say. Uh huh. And so like this is all full. And then we have all the decks right here in paper. And, uh, cause we also play test over here, uh, 
either at the house or at the uh, at the game shop. Mm-hmm. We want so we want to make sure that we have everything in in paper and what we do with it once it's done. Then we also just slap a bow on that sucker and then we just keep on going. The reason why is because if we would have to revisit. Yeah, I don't know. How, I don't even know how many decks we must have at this point. But uh, if we would have to uh, look at, let's say, fifty decks and uh, revisit them each with all the new cards that come out, you know, because new sets are coming out very constantly, fast, absolutely. Right? And it's one hundred and fifty cards every single time uh, or more. So if you need to look at all those cards and then have to cross analyze them with the upwards of fifty decks that we've got over here to see if any card could be swapped out, um, that would take such a long amount of time that we wouldn't actually be able to focus on, and I think the most interesting part, which is developing completely new commander decks. So yes, it would be perfectly possible to do that, but then we'd have to sacrifice new decks, and I don't think that would be a, a great uh, investment in time. No, that wouldn't be a good trade-off. I'm looking forward to seeing what you're coming up with next all the time. Um, so having said all that, uh, a little bit about your channel. You folks, you have a Patreon account, I know, because you are the one and only... <laughs> The one and only magic channel that I am a patron of. Uh, not that I wouldn't like. Not that I wouldn't like to be a patron of more. But you guys, I absolutely felt like you guys have helped the most. And whether it appeared on camera, or whether it's been used before, or whatever. I think I mentioned to you earlier, just when we were talking, the fact that a significant portion of my my commander decks, my twenty commander decks, a significant portion of them came directly from, uh, or at least started out as MTG uh, budget MTG decks. So. Um, you, I appreciate you. that, and um, I obviously would like anybody that already doesn't know about you should absolutely mm-hmm. investigate uh, and check out your videos. Um, anything else that you'd like to plug? Do you have any merchandise or anything? Uh, yeah, we do. Actually, if you watch um, any of the uh, the videos, usually at the bottom, they have the, the Teespring account, and uh, we've got a couple of the designs that we have on T-shirts. We've got some logos and stuff like that that you can uh, that you can wear on there. I think you'll see it in the uh, probably by the time this video comes out, probably the Gerard uh, Golgari Lich Lord video will be out on uh, my channel as well because I'll be editing it tomorrow and probably putting it up uh, maybe the same day or the day after that. So we'll, it'll probably be up uh, by the time this video is up as well. And then if you check it out there, I'll, I'll be wearing uh, one of the shirts as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I look forward to that. Uh, so, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this is so much more than what I what I hope to get. I really love that you took the time to sit down and talk with me. Uh, I appreciate you, the work that you do and the work that everybody else does going into to this channel. And uh, like, comment, and subscribe and go to your channel, yeah? Yeah, thank you very much. It was uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun actually. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, your questions, and it really had made me because you sent the questions out before, so it really made me think to myself, okay, how do we do this? So uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun to uh, to give give a good thought about this. Stuff. A lot of times when you're dealing with a creative process, it's hard to know what goes into it until you really sit down and and make that effort to think about trying to parse it out and say, yeah, this is what I have to do. This is what I have to do. Well, thank you for taking that time again, and. No uh, We'll talk to you again sometime, hopefully. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.